love Pastor Chris and his family very much. Uh, so happy to meet your parents, Lauren, today who've moved in. Welcome home to West Tennessee, by the way. Um, we, te- you know, Texas needed to move, move west any- or move east anyway, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Pastor Chris um, is a relatively new pastor friend of mine, but I sure love him. And uh, thank you for loving uh, the pastor and his family. And uh, I am so grateful for this church family. Holly Grove is one of our leading churches in the uh, western side of our state in giving to missions and to uh, missionary causes. You, you probably know that. Um, and I'm here really to say thank you today. Thank you for uh, your gracious giving through the cooperative program and all the missions offerings that you are participating in. You are among the top 10% in the state of Tennessee in giving to missions. And so I'm here to say bless you, thank you. And um, as, uh, as such, I, I, uh, we have a church home. My wife, Rhonda, and I are members of Faith Baptist Church in Bartlett, where I served as pastor for nearly three decades, 27 years plus. And uh, now I am a homeless, roaming preacher. <laughs> every, every Sunday in our mission field, in, in Harvest Field 1, we have 530 churches, 15 counties. That's 530 pastors that I'm supposed to keep in line. So uh, if you can pray for me, I would appreciate it very much because you know how impossible that is. Um, But I I don't do this just everywhere, but I'm so grateful for God's hand of favor upon this church. It's so refreshing to see the nursery filled with little babies and all those beautiful children uh, in the house today and all, all of you here today. Um, but I, I would like, if it's okay, I, don't, I didn't read the bylaws and I don't know the polity and I didn't get permission from the pastor, but if I, if I could get a second, I would like to make a motion that I could join as an honorary member of Holly Grove Baptist Church. Can, can I get a second or a second? And all in favor say aye. Certainly there are none opposed, amen. So I'm sure there's probably an honorary tithe envelope that I need to pick up somewhere along the way as, as well. Well, I'm glad to be here. I feel at home, and um, what, a, what a privilege to be here on the first Sunday of the new year. And today I want to share a brief devotional kind of a message with you today that I've simply called the glory of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if we get anything right in this world, we need to be sure that we get the gospel right, that we understand how to define and defend and declare the good news of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul spent all of his ministry doing just that. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you'll open your Bibles there, very familiar passage, going to look at that text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, I'm going to invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse number 16. And you'll see this is a very familiar passage. Uh, the Apostle Paul here in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 and following says, Therefore, from now on, We regard no one, no man, according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Just to pause there. The word reconciliation means to bring together things that were broken. I'm so grateful that Jesus brings us back to a right relationship with the Father. And, and, and on, uh, on down, he says this in verse 19, that is that, that God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors, we are representatives for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him, that is the Father made the Son, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a word. What a gospel. I want to ask you to pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you for Uh, Lord, your blessings upon this church family in these days. Lord, I I thank you for uh, the pastor and his family that you've called here to serve. And Father, thank you for um, new members who've joined and guests who are here even today. Lord, we believe that your hand of favor is upon this church family. And Lord, I pray that as we begin this new year, 
Lord, that we would grow more in love with you, more committed to you. Father, that our heart would be more burdened about lost people around us than ever before. God, I pray that you would do um, your work in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you're being seated, I, I, I'm just reminded, you may have heard the story. There was a story told about uh, a state trooper, a Georgia state trooper down near Atlanta, who was doing his duty and going through the highway system in that great city. And, and uh, all of a sudden, the traffic on Interstate 20 that runs right through Atlanta began to stop and slow down and almost come to a, a halt. The trooper had not heard anything on his radio, so he went around the traffic to find out the source, and he came up behind a, a really nice car, a really nice automobile that was going extremely slow on the interstate. He got behind the car, he pulled, uh, turned his lights on, the car pulled over. He walked up to the window, and it was a, a, an elderly lady driver, and she had two or three passengers in the car with her, and she rolled down her window and said, Sir, is there any problem? And the officer said, well, that's why, I, that's why I pulled you over. I wanted to be sure that you weren't having problems. You're going so slow on this interstate. Well, the lady got rather offended. And she said, sir, I'll have you know that I'm going exactly the speed limit. I was going exactly 20 miles an hour. <laughs> well, the officer realized what she had done. And so he said to the little lady driver, ma'am, this is Interstate 20. And the speed limit is 65 miles an hour. You need to, you need to just pick up the speed or these big trucks are going to run over you when... He, he just smiled and, and started to walk away, but he noticed inside the car the other ladies were a little disheveled. Their, ha their hair was a mess. Their faces were flush. And so the officer said, ma'am, are, are your passengers okay? And the little lady driver said, they'll be okay in a minute. We just got off of Highway 185. <laughs> and so the story goes. It's one thing to misread a speed limit sign or a highway sign. Brothers and sisters, with all of the chaos and confusion in our world today, we need to be sure that we get the gospel exactly right. The Apostle Paul, as I mentioned before, spent his ministry defining it, defending it, and declaring the gospel. That's what we've been called to do in our generation. Your pastor, all the people here, we've been called to, to know the gospel and to share the gospel as we, as we have opportunity. And uh, I, I'm just reminded that um, the gospel is something that is the power of God Paul would say it in Romans chapter 1, the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I want you to think with me about how significant it is that we understand the gospel and get the, the, the meaning of it correctly, the glory of it uh, intact in our heart. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gave us the foundation of the gospel. I won't read those verses, but he talked about the, uh, the skeleton or the bones of the gospel being the uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, then he begins to put you know, meat on the bones as he continues in uh, writing to the church at Corinth. And when he gets to the, to the letter to Romans, the book of Romans is all about uh, the, the greatness of the gospel and the nuances and all that it means. So here in this very familiar passage, we have just some reminders, just uh, three or four major themes that I want to remind the church of today. And I, I want us to renew our commitment to today as we think about the good news that has been given to us. And Paul, by the way, gave great warning about getting the gospel right. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul said this, if we or an angel of the Lord preach any other gospel than that which I have proclaimed, let him be accursed. It is very critical that we get the gospel right. So I want you to notice three or four things. First of all, if you're taking notes, uh, I, I encourage you to write down three or four words that'll help you come back and think about uh, these very familiar passages. First of all, I want you to notice the inclusive nature of the gospel, the inclusive nature of the gospel. In a verse that probably many of us have memorized, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, uh, it starts off this way, therefore, if any man is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ. In verse 16, that therefore looking back to verse 16, Paul says, hey, listen, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter your position. Uh, none of that matters. All that matters is on the inside. The outside doesn't matter uh, a hill of beans, if I can use that out here in the country. Amen. <laughs> and so we have here this reminder that, that um, everyone needs Jesus. doesn't matter what your, what your, what your past looks like. Uh, what, what, what burdens you came into church with on this first Sunday of 2024. Um, in fact, um, I, I remind you that the inclusive nature of God's good news is not merely a New Testament concept, it's an Old Testament concept. I remind you of the, 
the covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and down in verse 3 where he says, And through you, Abram, shall all the peoples of the earth be blessed. The prophet, uh, the Lord would speak through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55 when he would ask the question, Is, anyone, is anybody thirsty? Is anybody hungry? Come. Uh, come and buy bread. Come and drink from the water. Um, that the well that never runs dry, everyone is invited, everyone's invested. And so we have here uh, an Old Testament and a New Testament concept, some verses that you know well. How about John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, listen to the word, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I don't know if you've thought about it lately, but it is really a good thing to be a whosoever. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. A verse that you probably know well, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus is wrapping up his message to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and, and he kind of concludes with this. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man will open the door. Can I just tell you, that, 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 that uh, verse brings an illustration to my mind and a reminder to all of us I think we should visit once in a while. When Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, you know what that means? He knows where you live. He knows your address. He knows your name. And he has taken the initiative to come up into your neighborhood, come down your street. He's standing on your front porch and he is knocking on the door. He said, if anyone will open the door, I will come in with him. And the old King James said, and sup with him, and he with me. I, I love that so beautifully. Do you know in, the, in, the, in, the, in understanding the glory of the gospel that our responsibility when the Lord Jesus is knocking on our heart's door is simply to open the door, to open the door. Let me, let me remind you that the door of salvation swings on two hinges. The door of salvation swings on the hinge of faith personal trust in, in the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. We have to put our faith and our trust in that truth. And it also swings on the hinge of repentance, a changed life, a changed mind. We're no longer going to live like we used to live. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do what the, the Bible commands. We're going to believe and repent of our sin and turn toward the Lord Jesus and to live our lives for his glory for the rest of our days. So, so we have here the inclusive nature of the gospel. Every once in a while, Pastor Chris, you know this is true, we'll be out and we'll make a visit in the community or we'll invite somebody to come to church and somebody will say something like this. I've heard it many times through the years. They will say, Pastor, you don't want me to come down to that church. If I were to walk into that church building, the roof might fall. And you don't know, you don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. You don't know my background. And, and I quickly want to say to them, you're right. I don't know your past, and I don't know your background, and I don't need to know the details. Amen. But I'll tell you this. It's true in the church that I pastored. It's true in this church. This roof has been sorely tested many, many times. I mean, just look at the crowd here today. I'm shocked <laughs> that the roof is still standing. Truth of the matter is... The grace of God is greater than all our sin. Aren't you grateful that he looks beyond our fault and sees our need? That the grace of God is greater than, than our pain, our past? Um, one, of the, one of the great old hymns of the faith. In fact, I, I, I probably could have used your hymn. Y'all have hymn books somewhere around here? Maybe not. So I bring my own with me, by the way. The classic 1956 Baptist hymn. Can I get a witness from somebody? Amen. Uh, outside the Bible, my favorite devotion book right here, 1956. So uh, go ahead and open up to him, number 241. I'm teasing, 241. But I do want to read the lyrics to this great old song that just says what, what, we're, what we're talking about. I will arise and go to Jesus. Listen to it. Come, you sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. I love the last verse that says this. Come, you weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. And the chorus of this sweet little song says, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. 10,000 charms. If you're here today and you have never come to Jesus... 
I, I, I would beg you that in just a few moments, just in a few minutes, we have the invitation, Pastor Chris, to stand down front. For you just to come and say, I need to come home. I need to open the door. I need to give my life to Jesus today. Starting off the year 2024 in that, in that way would be absolutely a beautiful beginning and a, a, a reminder of the glory of the gospel. There are so many stories of sinners coming to Jesus in the gospels. Perhaps one of the most famous and one of my favorite is recorded for us, and you know the story well, in John chapter 4, the, the woman at the well. Remember that moment? Jesus said, I must need, the old King James again, I must needs go through Samaria. The disciples thought he was crazy, but he did it anyway. He sat by Jacob's well in the hot part of the day waiting, and before long, here she came down that dusty trail by herself, carrying a water jug, and Jesus initiated conversation. Remember the story? Jesus said this, something like this, and I paraphrase, ma'am, may I have something to drink? Simple question. May I have something to drink? Well, when he said that to the Samaritan woman, he just blew open all kinds of taboos. I mean, the, the protocols of the day were a Jewish man could never talk to a, a woman, particularly, but a, but a Samaritan woman, of course. In fact, if you remember the story, she called him out on it. She said, sir, how is it that you, being a Jewish man, would, would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And what Jesus said next, oh my. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to the original. He said something like this, ma'am, if you only knew who was asking you for a drink of water, you would ask of him, and he would give you living water, and you would never thirst again. You see, Jesus knew something about that woman that she had not wanted to admit. She was so thirsty. She was dying a thousand deaths for a relationship that would last. And Jesus said, I am the water of life. And so we see here the inclusive nature of the gospel. I, I, I just remind you how significant, how important that is. Secondly, I want you to see, not only does the scripture say, therefore, if any man, uh, anyone, anywhere who calls upon the name of Jesus can be saved, but notice, notice the relational nature of the gospel. The relational nature of the gospel. He said it very clearly. If, any, if anyone is in Christ, that little phrase, those words in the Greek language, are among the favorite words of the Apostle Paul in describing what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a believer? To be in Christ is all relational language. Uh, Paul sees this um, uh, coming not just from you know, the, the gospel that he's declaring, but it's connected directly to the Old Testament pictures and symbols of, of uh, God's Word. For instance, the ark in Noah's day. And when the door was open, the only place to be when the storm was coming is inside the ark. The door was open for a long time. And the invitation was given. And when the floods came, it was too late. The door was closed. The Lord shut the door. Uh, brothers, Jesus is the ark. We've got to be on the inside, not on the outside looking in, thinking we should, maybe we should have done something while we could. No, listen, today's the day of salvation. Today is Exodus chapter 12, the Passover. The only way to be saved, the only way to avoid the certain death of the firstborn was to be under the blood of the lamb that was sprinkled on the doorposts. John the Baptist said it in John 1, 29, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There, there, there are many of those, those, those pictures, but again, um, the idea of opening the door, letting Jesus... Um, or, or for us to enter a relationship with Jesus is, is the key to that relational concept. Uh, can I just remind you of something you already know? The Christian faith, the Christian faith, the gospel of the Lord Jesus is, is distinct and different from every other world religion. I mean, you can check it, Google it, whatever. Um, all the other religions of the world, no matter if it's one of the famous ones or one of the lesser known ones or the Eastern mystical ones, th most of them, all of them have this in common. They're all about trying to be good enough, do enough good deeds, to get on the good side of whatever the deity is that you're trying to impress so that one day maybe you can get to heaven or maybe in some cases you can actually become a god yourself. That's some, some beliefs. For instance, in um, one of the largest world religions, in Islam, it's all about the scales. It's all about your good deeds versus your wickedness or your sins, your iniquities. 
And you better hope, brothers and sisters, when you die, the scales are tipped in your favor. Can I just say a word on behalf of all humanity everywhere? I am so glad that it is not about my good deeds when it comes to being right with God. Hey, listen, listen. All of our, even our best days, even our good deeds, the Bible says are like filthy rags. God's not impressed with our attempts to, of righteousness. It took something on our behalf that only God could do for himself. Jesus, listen, at the cross 2,000 years ago, all of the weight of my sin, your sin, the weight of the sin of the whole world, the wrath of God rested on the Lord Jesus there at the cross. I, I, again, I, I love the old song that says this, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. Where was it? At Calvary. Mercy there was great. And grace was free. There my burdened soul found liberty. I, I, I'm telling you, we can never say hallelujah enough for what God did for us at Calvary. And so we see the, um, the, trans, uh, the, 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 the relational nature of the gospel and the inclusive nature of the gospel. But I want you to notice the third thing. Notice the transformation. changes the atmosphere or the direction of a person's life. He gives us a new heart and a new start. Here's how the Apostle Paul said it. If anyone is in Christ, anyone, inclusive, in Christ, relational, if anyone is in Christ, he or she, they become a brand new creation. A new creation. God has done a new work in your life. Um, Created in Christ Jesus on two good works. God to someone, man, that guy's a piece of work. Say amen. Uh, design that God is working on. And, and how many of you know the Lord's not quite finished with all of us yet, but we're being transformed. We're being changed from the inside out. And this new creation concept is so beautiful. H have you ever seen it happen in the life of someone that you thought, man, that person could never change? I, I have stories. I have testimonies. My own family's filled with... I, I came to know Christ out of a family that was not a church-going family. Our father was a uh, World War II vet. Uh, PTSD, self-medicated um, alcoholic for his whole life. And I'm the youngest of five kids, and I, I saw my father literally melt under the preaching of the gospel and put his faith and trust in Jesus. My dad was saved. After I came to know Christ, my father was saved, my brother was saved. I, I'm telling you, uh, I, I am so grateful for the transformational power of the gospel. You have somebody in your family, you have someone among your friends who, who you, maybe you used to be praying for, maybe you maybe you've stopped, or maybe you just forgot, or maybe, maybe you thought this, this is not going to happen, but I'm going to tell you something, it's never too late, and it's always right to pray for those who need the Lord. I, 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 want, you to, I want you to be reminded that there is no addiction so strong, no chains so tight, that the power of the gospel through a relationship with Jesus Christ can't break. We see it happen all the time. People try everything else. They try all kinds of, you know, everything to get set free. Gee, listen, the Bible says if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And, and what people need is a relationship. With, not just religion. Not, not just to go to church, but we need to become members of the church. We need to become a, a new creation in Christ, right? We need that relational, transformational power. And the fourth thing that I want you to see that will set, uh, set the definition up straight for us is the, the glory of the gospel, and that is the supernatural nature of the gospel. You see, this whole thing about the, the truth of God's Word and the teaching of the, of the Bible and the story of Jesus, the Son of God who came to die on the cross and raise again, be raised again on the third day, this, this is not a natural, this is not a man-made, made-up story. This is the supernatural power and purposes of God working out for us a pathway to be made right with Him. You know, it would have been just as easy for the Lord just to slam the door shut, but He's knocking on the door. 
He's knocking on the door. In fact, there have been times historically where the Lord has just said, okay, if that's what you want, then have it, have it your way. In the days of the prophet Malachi, they were giving their leftovers. Remember that, that they, were, they were giving uh, their, their lame and blind sheep, you know, and, and sacrifice. And you remember what the Lord said? In, in Malachi chapter 1, you can read it. The Lord said, why doesn't somebody shut the door? Stop. Stop playing games. Stop giving me your leftover time, your leftover energy, your leftover worship. I, I don't want anything uh, that's, that's not your best. In fact, the Lord did shut the door for 400 years. Four centuries of silence. And then through the dark, we just celebrated the Christmas season, through the dark night of four centuries of silence, came the voice, the sound of a little baby the king of kings being born in Bethlehem. Shepherds went to see, and sure enough, it was true. John the Baptist was on the, was on the, uh, on the mission, and, and, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The writer John said it this way, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, thank the Lord that Jesus has provided the way for us, and it is supernatural. In fact, um, just a couple of things about the passage that we just read. Two concepts. Uh, first of all, that God would use us in the process as his ambassadors, his representatives. We are ambassadors. We have the ministry of reconciliation. I, I, I'm just telling you, I'm so grateful that God's still calling, um, calling people into ministry and missions. Brother Chris, one of the things we've talked about and prayed about in our state, we, we need some more uh, young men and women to answer the call to Christian service. We need some young men to say, I believe God's calling me to be a pastor to serve the Lord in that way through His church. We need some men and women to serve as missionaries in, in, um, in these days. And so I'm going to ask my new honorary church to continue to pray to that end, that some of these beautiful young people here would be called out and, 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 and sent out from you to, to serve the Lord in the next generation, uh, that God would allow us the privilege. In fact, um, I didn't introduce earlier, but my travel companion today is my oldest grandson, Jeremiah. Um, I haven't told him this in a long time, but I've been praying for my grandsons. I have five grandsons. I used to be so jealous of people that had girls. <laughs> Lauren, I, you know, just always, always, people had girls. I had three sons. Then I promptly had five grandsons. But now I've got two little granddaughters. And I'm completely out of money. I have no money left. <laughs> Those girls, man, I'm telling you. But you know what my wife Rhonda and I are praying for? That some of ours... I've got one, one of my three sons is a pastor. He's in, at First Baptist in Milan, and his new, y'all are the new guys on the block. I'm praying for some of my grandsons. Not, not, that, not that Papa would call them out, but the Holy Spirit of God would call them out. And, and we could lay them on the altar of Christian service and say, Lord, anywhere you want them to go, the dangerous places, the hard places. That's my prayer. I want that to be your prayer as well. I, I want to I remind you of the second part of that supernatural thing. Not only that God would use us, but listen, here's the great mystery of the gospel. That, that Jesus, that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. And here's the, here's the language. He who knew no sin became sin for us on the cross. Think about that exchange. All of our sin debt, all of our unrighteous deeds were heaped upon Jesus. And at the same time, because of his, his amazing grace, the righteousness of the Son of God was moved over to our account for those who trust and believe. We who would never deserve anything but condemnation now can come before the throne of God because of his amazing grace. Brothers and sisters, this is the glory of the gospel. And the church, Holly Grove Baptist, has been commissioned to take that message out from this room, out from these classrooms, and out into the highways and the byways and the neighborhoods that are coming. People are coming, by the way. Some of our, some of our farmers in the area, uh, I say this everywhere I go, I'm going to mention it here today, if, if some developer comes to you and offers you more than you can refuse, for your land because the new homes are going to be needed uh, over the next several years. I'm just going to ask you to remember to give a tithe to your church of land so that Holly Grove can plant a new church somewhere out here in the community. Amen. I'm asking godly landowners and farmers to be generous. 
Give, give away to the Lord four, five, six, seven acres so that we can plant some new churches out here because the people are coming. And, and listen, it's not somebody else's responsibility, it's ours. Um, we have the good news. We have the great news. We have the glory of the gospel. And, and we are called and we are commissioned to take that good word out from here. So everywhere that I've been going, I've been in this role with Tennessee Baptist now for two years. This month is two years. And in every church that I preached on Sunday mornings, I've been asking this question. And here's the question. I want, I want you to write it down. I didn't bring this in the notes, but write down this question on your notes. Here's the question. Who do I know? Who do I know that is near to me? Write that down. Who do I know that is near to me but far from God? Who do I know? A brother or a sister, a child, a grand, grandchild, a neighbor, a co-worker, a classmate, a friend. You know somebody that's near to you, but they're far from God. And, and so what I've been doing is I've been bringing these little cards, these little white cards. I know you guys did something like this probably back in the summer or the fall, but this is just a little bit different. This is just a, a, a card to put someone's name on. And Brother Chris doesn't want these back. This is for you to keep in your Bible. This is for you to keep on your desk, on your refrigerator, somewhere where you can remember to pray for this family member or friend to come to know Christ. And so what I've done is I've brought some of these cards with me today. And as a part of the invitation, I'm going to invite you today to come during the singing of the invitation and come down and on either side, pick up one, one or two or three of these cards and take them home with you and put the names down and you begin to pray for lost family, lost friends. I believe that the key to revival is, is, is prayer. And, and the key to people coming to Christ is prayer. I remember as a 13, 14 year old little boy just coming to know Christ, uh, beginning to grow in my discipleship. I had a card like that and I put my dad's name down. I, 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 or I put dad on the card. I remember as a young boy, not sure that it could ever happen. But I prayed for my dad to change. And one day, bless the Lord. The breakthrough happened. The glory of the gospel took root and bore fruit in my father's heart and life. And it could happen in your loved one as well. I'm just asking you to pray. I'm asking you to, to revisit that burden for a lost family member, a lost friend. And I'm going to invite you to bow with me right now as we go into a brief time of invitation. Your pastor is going to be down front. He is going to receive you. There may be some today who think, you know what? It's the first Sunday of the new year. I need to join the church. You're a guest today and you need a church home. Why don't you come and say, Pastor, I would love to come and be a member of, of Holly Grove Baptist Church. You can do that here today. There may be some people in the room today that are just saying, you know what? I haven't really had a lot of joy about my salvation. I haven't been, uh, I haven't been praying like I should be. I, I haven't been serving the Lord. I haven't been sharing the gospel. But today, I want to reconnect and recommit my life to Christ. And maybe you, you want to come to the altar and pray, or maybe you want to pick up one of these cards, or maybe with Pastor Chris. You just want to say, would you pray for me? I need a new start here at the beginning of this new year. I, I want a fresh new beginning with my walk with the Lord, and he can help you. He can encourage you. And there may be someone in the room today. There may be someone in the room today. Other people have been praying for you. Maybe like that woman at the well, you're thirsty. and You've been looking at all the wrong places. Maybe like the leper, you're wondering, is there any hope for me in Luke chapter 5? And, and Jesus reaching out and touching you today, making things clean. If you're here today, and I'm going to invite you again just to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you've never prayed a prayer like this, something like this, Lord, I, I know that I'm not perfect. Lord, my life really is a mess and I need help. And so I'm calling right now on Jesus. Lord Jesus, I trust you. I put all of my faith in you. And Lord, I want to turn away from my old ways. And I want to repent of that. I want to turn toward you. Help me, Lord Jesus, to have a new heart and a new start. And if that is your prayer, why don't you come and tell Pastor Chris, today I, I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus. I want a fresh new beginning with him. And, and whatever the Lord's telling you to do today, why don't you, why don't you just be obedient? I'm going to pray. I'm going to get out of the way. And the singers are going to sing. And we're going to hopefully... See you come to pick up some of these cards, begin to pray for your, your family, your friends. You do whatever the Lord tells you to do today. Father, thank you, thank you for the glory of the gospel. Thank you for Jesus who made a way for us to have a relationship with you. 
And Father, I pray that you would help us to be brokenhearted over uh, the, the lostness in our family, the lostness among our friends. And God, I pray that this church would have a renewal and a revival. Lord, that we would see people come to know Jesus by the dozen, 